Yeah, thanks, um, Debbie, and thanks, Stefan, uh, for the introduction, and thanks also to Netsen and uh, to City University for inviting me. Um, I had hoped to be in London now. Uh, unfortunately, I'm here in um, my office room at home, um, which is a bit lonely, but I, but I still hope to uh, tell you a bit about the work that I've been doing with a lot of people on collecting data with smartphones, and I'm happy to be able to tell you a couple of things. So at the end, I also hope to have a little bit of more time for, uh, for questions. So there's, there's time for some questions during the presentation, but hopefully also after, depending on how time goes. So um, first of all, a lot of the work that I'm presenting today is joint work with a lot of people, especially people from Statistics Netherlands. Um, so you see a long list of names here, and I have to single out uh, Buddy Schout from Statistics Netherlands who's really been driving a lot of the work um, that we've done over the past couple of years. Also, for those of you who are interested in doing data collection with smartphones and would like to know more, I can really recommend a seminar that was given by Annette Jekle, um, actually about half a year ago, also in the same seminar series. Um, I have the long link here in my um, slides, but I, I noticed earlier on there was also a shorter link available to these same slides. Um, I also want to thank a lot of people uh, working at other universities for uh, talking about smartphones and uh, experiences that they have shared with me in, on how to do data collection with smartphones. So, so I want to start here, which is um, a slide which shows you what people often think is the promise of doing research, social research with smartphone apps. So, so the basic idea I think goes um, as follows. People nowadays spend a lot of time on their mobile phone, some people say all day, um, and mobile phones are very versatile devices. You can use them for all kinds of things. So you can call people, you can ask them questions, you can do a normal survey, but you can also collect all kinds of other things. So sound, pictures, you can see where people are, so you can track their locations. Perhaps you can follow people, what they do on their mobile phones, so or follow their online behavior, uh, track their social media, etc. And so people think that smartphones are the future of social research. And to be honest, this, like four or five years ago, when I started doing these kind of studies, this is actually what drew me to this subject as well. I think there is a lot of potential in, in doing research with smartphones. Um, you see this also today in the COVID-19 crisis. So at least in the Netherlands, where I am from, and I know of many other European countries, there is this idea that if you develop a smartphone app that you can use this for all kinds of different things. So you can use an app to uh, do some sort of diagnostic screening. So you can, you can say what kind of complaints you have and the app will tell you whether you are perhaps likely to have COVID or not. Um, and more recently, apps have been developed to, to track uh, where people go uh, trace uh, possible infections and with Bluetooth uh, technology try to um, identify people who are at risk of also testing positive. Now this slide may not come as a surprise. I think that a lot of the expectations of doing research with apps um, are inflated. So one of the problems is yes people spend all day on their mobile phones but does that mean that they are willing to also participate in research on their mobile phone? Um, I think some of the evidence that we have so far points out that people do not always want to participate. And you also see in published research on smartphone apps, the problem is often that there are relatively small samples of volunteers, very selective samples. So it's really, I think, uh, an open question whether you can um, employ apps to do research among the general population. I think a second issue is really that, yes, smartphones can collect all kinds of cool data, but then again, what is the quality of all these kind of data and what are you going to do with all these kind of data? Um, and then you also run into all kinds of more practical issues. Um, how do you develop an app? How do you distribute it? Uh, how do you make sure that it works on all kinds of different devices? And so what I want to talk to you about today is some experience uh, of some studies that we've done over the past couple of years. Um, and the basic question that we had was, can you do a general population survey using smartphone apps? 
Um, so I want to talk about that. And I also want to talk about some of the more kind of practical issues. Um, if you do research with smartphone apps, how do you process the data, integrate everything? And in the end, how do you calculate statistics? So how do you get to, to outcomes that are actually useful? And because much of the research that I do is together with Statistics Netherlands, we are often interested in, in producing official statistics, which is quite a high bar to, uh, to reach sometimes. All right, so um, here are some, some general slides um, that uh, I think uh, reflect some of my thinking in when to use apps, because I, I don't think that we should use apps for everything. So first of all, I think um, one reason to use apps is if we know that surveys are not very good, uh, right? So for example, we know, everyone knows this in survey research, there are especially certain topics where it's just very difficult to do surveys. This may be because um, the things that we want to know from respondents uh, are things that respondents don't know themselves. So for example, if you're interested in people's social network, people may be able to tell you who their friends are, but if you really want to track behavior, um, people don't know who they see, who they talk to, how often they do this, etc. cetera. Um, a second problem may be a high burden. So often we want to know things that a respondent may know about their own behavior or their attitudes, but it just takes them a lot of time to, to, um, to do a survey. So one example is, for example, if you're, if you're interested in, in what people spend, and what they spend it on. Uh, people often know what they spend their money on, um, but it's really hard to get a fine-grained and detailed idea of what exactly they spend it on and how much money they spend it on. And this was the topic of um, mostly of Annette Jekyll's talk that I referred to earlier. So on top of these two specific reasons, I think there's a general reason we, we know that surveys are costly and, and time-consuming, right? So there is maybe this sort of general push of going away from surveys. Uh, apart from the push, there's also the pull, right? So the, so the pull is, it's easier and, and more um, effective, I think, to use mobile apps if you know that the data that you can collect uh, are easy to collect. So this is what I call organic data. So this is um, data that you can collect um, with surveys, with apps more or less automatically. Uh, and that these costs of collecting and processing are quite low, right? If it's very costly, uh, why start doing that? Um, and what you want is point three, you want the data to be of general uh, high quality. So to give you an example, um, here is a screenshot that I just took from the internet. It's not from a particular survey that I have worked on, um, but here you see a, a diary kind of study. So, so diary studies are a particular kind of surveys where I think there's a lot of potential to do uh, smart, to use smartphone apps. So this is a, a food intake diary. Uh, and here you see um, um, uh, an exercise diary. So uh, on every day, what do people do? And you can easily perhaps replace this, right? So you can track people's exercise with a, an accelerometer, which are nowadays available on Fitbits and other devices. And if you want to measure food intake, well, there's a potential of, for example, asking people to, to take a picture. And you can do this with apps, but as I will show you later on, uh, you don't always have to use apps on smartphones. There's also the possibility of using a browser for uh, collecting data. So I want to focus today on two examples of studies that, that I've been involved in. Uh, so the first one is a travel study. So again, this is a study where usually diaries are being used where people keep track of where they travel over, the, over a period. And the second example is an example where we ask people to take uh, pictures. Uh, and I will tell quite a bit about how we set up these studies and also some of the some of the results. So the first study is the smartphone app travel uh, study. So this is a study that's done by Statistics Netherlands um, yearly, uh, produces all kinds of travel statistics. In the past, so the old survey was was a web diary study or previously a paper and pencil diary study where people keep track of where they go for two days. So they need to um, write down the start, the end time, where they start, where they travel, with whom they travel, what kind of transport modes they use, etc. This is a survey that's really burdensome from people. Response rates are quite bad. There's a problem with missing data in the data. And also we know that the quality of the data here are, is not really high. So we, um, two years ago, we did a big field test where we tried to see whether a smartphone travel app could replace this new study. 
So we call this new app Tabi, which is a Japanese word for uh, travel. Um, and, and the idea is here that we would follow people with their smartphones and we would track them using uh, Wi-Fi and GPS sensors, uh, their location. Um, every minute when people were stationary and every second when they were moving. And um, what you then get is really fine-grained data. So here I'm showing you part of a map of the city of The Hague in the Netherlands. And what you will see uh, is a trip that someone took traveling from The Hague to the city of Utrecht. So the line that you see now are locations. So I'm plotting this over time. So you see that here someone leaves and is traveling. The green line is just a color. These data are unedited, so I'm not, uh, you, you will also see, see here there's a gap in the data. You saw the blue line all of a sudden uh, appearing out of nowhere. Uh, so GPS data are not perfect, right? There's, uh, you suffer from problems with precision. There's sometimes gaps in the data because of technological problems. So here you see someone now arriving at Utrecht Central Station. Um, there's something going on here which is a bit vague, and then you see the trip continuing um, the colors of the lines reflect here that the different parts of the trip as we identify them and then here arriving at their destination. So this is just one, one trip that I played very uh, quickly. But the basic idea is, is that these are the data that will come in with an app automatically. And the idea that we have with the app is, is using this data to then populate the diary. Right? So if we know what time people start a trip, what time they end and where they go, we can use this kind of data to populate a diary. And here I'm showing you some screenshots of how the diary works. So this is um, a, a diary on the left for a, a full day. I'm sorry the app is in Dutch, so some of the, the labels here are in Dutch, but, but you get, I think, the basic idea. You see locations here, and then you see that in between those locations are trips, and you also see that here in the app that we uh, indicated how long this particular trip was. Now, what you also see is that um, there are green tick marks and also some pencils. So respondents can here click on different things in the app. So here you see, for example, a respondent who clicked on a particular stop, a visit that uh, the respondent made. And now the respondent can actually annotate this. So here uh, the respondent is actually giving a name to a stop. So what is this? You also see that there are some suggestions there. And if the respondent did that, you would see here now that the, respond, that the, the stop gets a, gets a label. On the second screen, you also see how, this, how our app uh, looked like on Android. I'm now moving on to the third um, screenshot here, which is uh, the same app, but then on an Apple. So you see that the, the app was developed cross-platform. And you see that there are very subtle uh, design differences between the two. We try to cap them minimal, but you always end up with some uh, differences. So here you see this is a different diary because it's a different uh, a person. And here again, you see how a trip would look like in the app. And the respondent can here actually select what is the mode of transport. So what is very nice is that we can infer what is the mode of transport data based on the GPS data alone. But we also ask respondents to label some of these data. You see that if the respondent labels data, that there's a green tick mark indicating to the respondent that the respondent is um, done with annotating that trip. So there would be multiple days, respondents can switch between days, and there were also some, some questions that we asked before and after the app about the general travel behavior and how the app um, worked. Now, when we did this test, we wanted to just test whether the app would work, but we were also interested in, in finding out some more uh, fundamental questions about how to do this kind of studies. Um, and as social scientists, you then uh, try to do an experiment, and that's what we did. We did three experiments in this um, app, and I'm going to talk about two. The first experiment concerns recruitment. So we recruited people for this app in two different ways. So the first was we took a fresh cross-section from the population register that we have access to. So the population register is an individual register with addresses and some covariates. Um, and then we had a second sample, which consisted of respondents who, in the previous month, participated in this old diary study. So we took some existing respondents from the survey. The two reasons for that, we, we wanted to see um, whether this fresh route works, whether you're sort of out, out of nowhere you can try to recruit people for an app. And we were um, 
concerned that this may not work. And our idea was if we, we take at least some respondents that have already participated in the study, we'll at least get some respondents. Um, and also what is very nice is that, of course, for these respondents that participated in the web diary, we have the old data and then we'll have the new uh, smartphone data and we can compare to these two data sources within persons. The second um, experiment that we did uh, was an experiment with incentives because we wanted to see whether incentives would help here. Three conditions. Uh, everyone got five euros unconditional. So with the invitation letter that they received, there was a cash incentive. Um, then there was the first group that got another time, two times five euros, once for registering the app and once after completing the whole study. So after completing the, leaving the phone, uh, leaving the app running on the phone for seven days. In the second condition, uh, they got the same amount of money, so 10 euros, but then only after completing the entire st uh, study. And in the third condition, we increased this conditional incentive to 20 euros. There was a third experiment, which I'm not gonna talk about today. This concerned how do we actually detect stops and trips? So this is a much more um, a technical, but very important experiment that we did. Um, what we did find out there is that um, it, our settings that we, we tried uh, to, to vary the stop detection, uh, it all didn't really have a, a big effect on whether a stop was detected or not. So the, our methods were quite robust to how we define what a stop and a trip is. All right, so how did we do this study? So everyone first got an invitation letter. Um, uh, in the invitation letter, there was a link to a website where they could find more information. There was a flyer. Um, and also a link that would directly lead to um, the App Store, right? So to the Apple Store or the Google Store, where people could download the app. If they did that, they would have to log into the app, so we would know who participates and who doesn't, and then they would have to allow location measurements. And this is what you see here in the screenshots. You see two, two screenshots where people have to allow us um, to, um, um, to track their location over time. All right, so, so these are the two um, parts of our sample, right? So we had 1,900 respondents that we approached, half fresh and half earlier respondents. And what we found when we looked at the uh, results of recruitment, we found that the response rates in the two parts uh, was quite high, was actually almost as high or even higher than the old web diary. So among the fresh respondents, 26% um, of people downloaded the app and, and logged in. And from the existing web diary respondents, this was 44%. Now this 44% is of course conditional on people having participated in an earlier study, right? And in this earlier study, the response rate was actually about 30%. So, so this is now the, respondent, the response rate conditional on participating earlier. So actually, if you would look at the response rates for the whole sample, actually, this number 44 is actually more like 12%. Anyway, we find that 674 people download the app and log in. We then find that we have quite a bit of dropout early on in the, um, in the app. This is because some, some respondents actually don't want to participate. They don't allow us to track their location, which makes the whole uh, uh, app sort of worthless. Another problem that we identified was that we had problems in particular with recent uh, iPhone users who just a few days before we went into the field installed the very newest version of iOS. So this came out a few days before we went into the field. And so we had not tested this new operating system for iOS and we, some respondents experienced troubles there. Okay, then we have some further dropouts or some respondents for whatever reason not leaving the app running on their phone for an entire week. And in the end, we have complete responses for about 22% of our gross sample, which was, um, to, to, our, to us at least, a, a pleasant surprise. We, we placed bets in advance of the study, and I think um, there were very few people who would expect that we would be able to get the response rate that this is high, that this high. Of course, you may argue whether it is actually high, right? 22% is still not, still not great, but we were still, we were still happy with it. We can do better, I think, if we would do it again. Okay, um, incentives. So what's the effect of the incentives? Um, so we find an effect that's uh, more or less consistent with the existing literature on incentives generally. 
if you pay people more, so 20 euros, um, you get a higher response rate, uh, roughly 10% higher than if you offer people five and five. What we thought was quite interesting was the difference between these first two conditions. So in the first condition, people receive five euros for in installing the app and then five euros for leaving it on their phone. And this amount is actually the exact same as the 10 euros that you would get in the second condition, but then you ha would have to leave it on your phone for seven days. And in a way it's easier, the first condition is easier, right? Because the only thing you need to do is, is install the app. But still we find that the response rate is, is higher in the second condition. We don't know exactly why our hypothesis is that, that 10 euros just sounds a lot more than, four, than five and five, although it is the same amount in the end. Um, all right, then um, on to uh, some, some more complicated uh, analysis. What was very nice in this study was that for all the people that were in our sample, we had the, um, some covariates available. So the population register in the Netherlands is quite rich in the sense that it doesn't only include people's address, but also lots of other things. So their age, their gender, their level of education, but also variables like, do you have a driver's license? Are you a car owner or a moped owner? And we, what we did is we, we looked at whether people registered the app. So the yes, this is a yes and no dependent variable. And then we included uh, all these covariates as covariates in these in logistic and, uh, regression analysis. And what I'm showing here are average marginal effects. And the way to interpret these are, are, are as follows. So if you would look at the first number, 0.16, it means that the probability of installing is 0.16 higher uh, when you were a previous respondent in the diary study as compared to a fresh respondent. So this is the difference between this 26.5 and the 44%. These are multivariate effects, right? So they're slightly different sometimes. So the effect of the incentive <coughs> is, is seven to 10%, right? The two conditions. And what is now more interesting is to look at the other effects. So what you see here in red are the significant effects. Um, the age effects here are really strong, right? So the um, over 65s, the probability of participating is 0.28 lower than uh, for other respondents. We also find really strong effects for education. So people with a higher education have a 20% higher response rate. Also, we looked at interaction effects. I'm not showing these here because we actually found no interaction effects whatsoever. So one thing that we wanted to find out was whether there were interactions between our experimental conditions, so the incentive and the uh, recruitment, and the covariates, because that would show that some people are more likely to be convinced, for example, by higher incentives. Uh, but we found no evidence for, for that at all, which was a good thing. All right, so first question, can we do it? Um, our answer was yes, we can, because the response rate that we obtained was really quite high, comparable to the normal web diary. And for some groups, especially young people, the response rate was actually much higher than what we are used to in normal surveys at Statistics Netherlands. Um, the downside of all of this is that we have really strong non-response bias, uh, especially in age and education. So we find that there are also particular groups, lower educated and older respondents, who are just not very keen to do this on an app. And so going forward, one of the things that we're now uh, going to investigate is to um, uh, use a mixed strategy, right? So to offer the app, but also offer a web diary or even a paper and pencil version for respondents who would not want to use the app. All right, uh, a few more slides before I uh, go into a short break. So if you have questions, this is the time to post them in the chat. Um, some results in terms of the, the, the quality of the data. So here I'm focusing now on the trips. So uh, what are the trips that people take and what are the characteristics of these trips? What is very nice is that we have two sorts of trips. So we have trips that were actually labeled by respondents. So where respondents said, I use a train or a bus or a car. And then we have unlabeled trips. And uh, here I'm showing you statistics from the app. Um, and I'm here looking at the differences between the labeled and unlabeled trips. So this tells us something about are respondents more likely to label some trips compared to others? And we find some evidence of that. So for example, we find among the label trips there to be quite a lot of car trips. 
So people are likely to, if they made a trip by car, to actually label it. Um, and people are less likely to actually label trips that they did on foot here on the, all the way at the bottom. And another thing that you see is that we, we have a, if the second to last row is user error. So these are trips that we, that the GPS identified as being trips, but where the respondents actually said, well, this was not a trip. And in, if you remember earlier where I showed you the trajectory, there was some evidence of this in the sense that there were sometimes these trips that were very short, especially if people switch from mo one mode of transport to another one, it's sometimes a bit unclear what is going on. And sometimes this results in very short trips of very short lengths. So this is one comparison that's interesting, but the more interesting comparison is when we compare the smartphone data to the data that we collected earlier, so earlier in the year, for the web diary, right? So if you would compare the web diary to the smartphone um, app, what kind of differences do we find? Um, we do find differences, and the differences are often in the direction that we want them. So for example, if you look at the duration of trips, we find in the web diary that the people really underreport very short trips, and the smartphone is really a lot better at documenting these very short trips. Um, there are also some things, if you would look at the transport modes, that uh, there are also here some differences. So for example, in the number of bike trips. And here we have a slight problem in the sense that when we did this study, uh, the smartphone study, there was a month with particularly bad weather. So people were perhaps less likely to use a bike and more likely to use other modes of transportation. All right. So conclusions from this first study. So there is large non-response bias, incentives work. We can flash, freshly recruit respondents. And we also find that measurement overall it was much better with the app than compared to the web diary. Uh, there were some technical issues and uh, what I didn't show you, but um, you have to trust me on this. It took us quite a lot of effort to produce these travel statistic tables. So there were people working for months on identifying where trips were, what were good trips and what not, uh, running classification models and producing these kind of statistics. Of course, we don't have to do all of this work again, but it was still a lot of work to set everything up. All right, so now uh, there's time for um, a short pause. So I'll pause for about three minutes to answer uh, questions that you have. And hopefully Debbie um, has looked at the chat and has some questions for me. So one question from Karina, Karina Conesso, have you considered offering people who do not want to use the app to participate uh, via the traditional diary? Um, that's something that we're now considering, right? So we're now considering using kind of a mixed strategy where we offer the app to, to some people, perhaps to everyone, and then to those people who would not want to use the app, then offer the, the option of doing a web diary or perhaps even a paper and pencil diary. Of course, this brings new problems. You need to have two infrastructures, so it's costly. Um, and you have to do a, quite a lot of modeling because we know that there are strong measurement differences between these two modes. So question from uh, Gian Maria Bottoni about, uh, can the app be used for field work monitoring? Yes, actually, that's a good question. And Statistics Netherlands is actually using the app, well, a slightly different version of this, to uh, not really monitor interviewers, but to just track where they go because um, they get paid for uh, their travel costs, which often is by car. Uh, they do a lot of face-to-face -face interviewing still. Um, and this automatically just tracks the number of kilometers that they, that they travel. So it, it saves a lot of work. All right, so a question here about how many of these stops and trips were actually being labeled, right? So of the visits that people did and of the trips that, that people did. Um, so here we found actually a difference between the stops and the trips. So the stops were the destinations. There we found that respondents were really good at labeling those. So about 75% of all the stops that we had were labeled by respondents. And we didn't even um, incentivize people to, to do this, right? We, we didn't even ask them to do it. So we just gave it to them as an option, but we didn't explicitly ask them to do it. It just came as a natural thing to do to respondents. For the trips, um, much less so. So there we had roughly 40% of all the trips labeled. It was still enough for the purposes of uh, labeling and, and, and doing the classification based on the GPS data. Um, 
But then we found also in the, the way that the diary worked that um, it was much more intuitive or much more rewarding also for respondents to give a name to a stop because the, the name of the stop would show up in the diary. And for the trip, it wasn't the case that there would be like an icon of a train or a bus or something like that that would show up and yet it would just show a tick mark and that's it. So going forward, I think that that's one thing we learned, giving the respondent at least some sort of uh, feedback, some sort of reward can really help if you want the respondent to really uh, label these kind of things. All right, I know there are more questions, um, but I will continue in the interest of time. Maybe we can come back to these questions later. All right, so second study, this is a, a very different study. So. Um, forget about the travel app for now uh, and this was also this was i want to show you this project because this is a project that we did without the use of apps so apps are are great apps apps can do a lot but apps are also quite a lot of work to develop to maintain um, and sometimes you don't want to invest all that money especially if it's more like a one-off project that you're doing um, you can also collect data through the browser on the smartphone. And here I want to show you some examples, uh, an example of a study that we did to collect pictures. So this is a study that we did uh, not with fresh respondents, but with panel members of the Dutch list panel. So for those of you who don't know the list panel, this is a probability based panel. So people were recruited offline. And once they're in the panel, they stay in the panel and they answer questionnaires about every month on all kinds of different topics, mostly social health related. Um, so these are not really normal people in the sense uh, because they, they respond to questionnaires about every month, but it's still based on a probability sample. And what we did is we asked uh, 2,700 of these people to answer a normal questionnaire on their mobile phone. We had some non-response, so in the end we have 1,700 respondents. And what we did in this questionnaire is we asked these people to take pictures. There have been a couple of studies that did this as well earlier, um, mostly by Melanie Revilla and colleagues. Um, and we sort of built on their work. And what we wanted to do is to see whether we can actually embed these kind of pictures in the context of a, of a wider survey. So the questions that we used here were questions actually from the survey on living conditions that's fielded in the Netherlands by statistics Netherlands every year and that also asks all kinds of things about the house um, so mostly factual things but also some attitudes and what we did in this study is we asked people to take pictures of their favorite place in their house so what place did they like most um, some part of their garden and of their heating system in the house this last question was was important because um, because of the energy transition, transition, and there is a lack of statistics on how efficient houses are being heated in the Netherlands. So the kind of pictures that we anticipated were pictures like this, right? So here you see some pictures of a balcony and of a, of a couch, if that's your favorite place. And these would be the heating systems that would be uh, most commonly used in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, so these are gas, most people use gas for, for heating. All right, so again here, we did an experiment because we wanted to know how this would work. And our basic question that we wanted to answer was, are people willing to take these pictures? And if you would give people a choice between answering survey questions or taking pictures, what would people actually do? So we had three conditions in this survey. In the first condition, we just asked them to take pictures. And the question was, would you be willing to take a picture of your favorite place, of your garden or a heating system? There would be some follow-up questions, right? So first of all, we ask people whether they had a garden, yes or no, etc. cetera. Um, so if people would say, yes, yes, I'm willing, then we would, they would be um, uh, asked to actually take the picture within the surveys from their browser. And after that, after they had taken the picture, they could see the picture and then they got a separate question, would you be willing to share this picture with us? In a second condition, um, people received text questions. So there the text questions was, the, the questions were slightly different, but the basic question was, can you describe your favorite place? Can you describe how your garden looks like, how large it is, um, where it's located? 
can you describe your heating system, the brand type, etc. In a third condition, we actually gave respondents a choice. So the first question that they would get was, we're going to ask you questions about elements of your house. Would you rather take pictures or would you rather answer questions here? So people could choose either, right, text or pictures. And depending on what they chose, they then got the questions that you would here see under condition one or condition two. So in condition one and two, we force them to take a picture or to answer text questions. In condition three, we give them a choice out of curiosity, how many people would choose to do text and, and pictures. So first of all, we wanted to know the willingness, right? So what happens here if we, if we do this? Second, we wanted to know what is the quality of the measurements? So do we actually get better data if we ask people to take pictures rather than ask questions? Um, yeah, so right. most of the work that I'm presenting here is done by Goran Ilic uh, of Utrecht University who uh, recently obtained his master's degree with an analysis of these data. Okay, so here are some results. Um, so there are three dependent variables. The favorite place, taking a picture of your outdoor area, so garden, um, and your heating system. So there you see them in the columns. And then there were these three conditions. So force people to take a picture, first row, text condition, and the choice, third row. Um, and what we find here is that if we ask people to take a picture of their favorite place, we find that 43% of the respondents here was willing to do that. So uh, they said yes. The text condition, almost everyone was willing to answer a survey question. This is what panel respondents are used to as well, so not, not unexpected. Um, in the third condition, where we gave people a choice, their people first, of course, had to say, yes, I'm willing to take a picture, and then they had to actually take the picture and, and share it with us. So there's more steps involved here. But what we find is if you compare condition one and condition three, that actually um, the proportion of people who actually send us the picture is more or less the same, right? So giving a choice does not decrease willingness. Here. Willingness is really uh, about the same, which was quite surprising to us. Then if you look at the quality of the data, so here I'm showing now um, only data for the heating system. So there were three pictures, but I'm here focusing on one in the interest of time. So the quality of the data for the, for the pictures, you see that overall we had about 700 people who got this question, are you willing to take the picture of your heating system? So some respondents here don't get this question because they have a heating system that uh, they live in an apartment building, for example, where the heating is shared with all the apartment buildings. So it's not easy to take a picture there. So they didn't get this question. Anyway, we get 700 people uh, with this question. Then we find that 300 people actually say, yes, I'm, I'm happy to actually take this picture for you and share it. Then we have a couple of um, pictures where actually we decided not to analyze the data because uh, there's all kinds of privacy sensitive information in the picture. So we decided not to, to, to throw these data away. Um, among the pictures that we have, we find that roughly 90% of respondents then actually take a picture of the thing that we are interested in. So this is in line with the task. They actually do what we ask. And then we find that 200 out of the 281 pictures are pictures that we define as having good quality, meaning that using an object um, text recognition, we're able to actually read what is the brand and, and, and or the type of the, of the heating device. Um, so based on this text, we, we would then try to ex extract the specific brand and specific type of the heating device, because that was actually the, the information that we wanted to have. And then we find that we can do this for only 142 pictures. So this is 44% of all the pictures that were submitted were actually really of good data quality. Now, if we extend our, if we're a bit more liberal and say, well, as long as we have the brand, we're also satisfied, we get to 76%. So uh, it's okay, but it's not really high. Now, the same thing for the text. So this is a bit easier to explain, right? So we, there we get texts. So some of the texts are, are really not informative at all, right? About hundreds cases. Um, here we also find, in the, by the way, that a lot of people don't want to provide the text to us. So they say, 
I can't read it. Uh, the heating system is in my attic and I don't want to go up there to actually check what brand and type it is. Or I can't find it. I don't know what my brand and type is. Um, so so the, the 484 cases that provided some text is text that is in a way about the device itself. Still, we find that about 100 cases provide data that is not useful to us. 142 provide us with the brand and the type. And again, if we're a bit more liberal, only the brand, then we get 385 uh, cases. So where does this leave us with the picture study? First of all, if you give people a choice between taking a picture and, and, and uh, providing uh, text, most people are kind of okay to take a picture. So roughly 60% of the people who we asked prefer to take the picture and then they actually do it. Um, if you ask people to write a text answer, people are generally more willing to do that. There are people who, who don't want to take a picture because of privacy reasons, because they think it's too difficult. Um, answers that they, that they provide, the text answers are generally slightly lower quality than the pictures. So in this case, the pictures, especially for the heating system, are, are more useful to us because we can extract more information from that. Um, if you, in the end, look at the percentage of, of good data that we get from the, uh, from the respondents and you would compare the different conditions, you don't find a really big difference though, because of all the respondents who answered a text question, 15% uh, have good data. Um, and in the picture, it's 20%. So really, this difference is quite small. And if you're a bit more liberal and say, well, even if the information isn't perfect, it's something we can use, these percentages increase. Um, they switch. But again, here, the difference is not really uh, that big. All right. So um, this is the end of the second study. And um, I know there's, there's a bit time for questions. I noticed there's a couple in the, in the chat. All right. So I'll take a couple of minutes to answer some questions. So the first question is, did people get responsive feedback while taking pictures? Uh, no, we should have maybe done that. So uh, they, they did see the picture, right? So they, they, they saw the picture that they took themselves. They could retake it if for whatever reason they didn't like the picture. Uh, and then they send it to us, but we, we didn't include any um, machine learning, object recognition things in the browser, in the app. Our software that we're using for this is not capable of including these kind of things. Yeah, so the question then, can the data be used to get information about the efficiency of the heating system? This is actually the ultimate goal. So we wanted to get the efficiency. And as long as we have the, the brand of the heating system and the type, we can get quite close to what actually the energy efficiency is. Of course, it's not only dependent on the heating system itself, but also like the, how well the, the home is insulated and all, all kinds of other things. But we don't have any picture data on that. There are, there, we have a few questions on that. Um, but, but the idea was that, that this would help us to get the energy efficiency. Um, final question from, uh, there were also panel members using a tablet. This is true. So respondents could also use a tablet. Um, in our case, there were very few though that, that use a tablet. So really most people uh, use a smartphone uh, to, to do this. And um, we didn't find a big difference between tablet users and mobile phone users in how likely they were to, uh, to send us a picture. All right. Okay, I have a few final slides before I open the discussion up for uh, more, more questions, more general questions. So where does this leave us, right? So I've now presented two examples. Why is this useful? So first of all, it's useful to, to learn about how to do um, research with apps. So the kind of practical experience, can you do it? Are people willing to do it? How do you set this up? But I think for survey research in particular, and, and I'm, I'm very interested in, in also studying how we can do these, uh, how to do studies better. I think there's something else that we can learn. So when we do a normal survey, the, the basic procedure goes as follows. We, we draw a random sample somehow, and then we do a survey. And then we study things like mole response error, mole response correlates, and we uh, study measurement. 
right? And, and the only data that we can generally use for that are data that we have from our frame that we use to draw the sample. And very often we don't have a lot of information on the frame, right? In some cases we, we have information because we're doing a survey in a special population or we're lucky and we have a population register, but often this is the information that we have. So the axis that you see here in the table, the observations and the non-observations, that's all the information that we have when we do a survey. Now, if you start collecting what I call organic data, so this could be pictures, it could be GPS locations, it could be browsing histories, could be all kinds of data that are kind of produced as a, as a byproduct of something else. You have this additional source of data and having this additional source, I think is very useful for, for, for many different reasons. So one thing we can, we can do if we uh, try to think about how can we use this kind of organic data in a good way, is that one way to do that is to start with the organic data, right? You just go to Twitter, you, you collect some data and then you use the Twitter data to say something. But I don't think that, that, that that's really a, a good way to go because then the only thing we have is the data itself and we know nothing about how these data say something about the population that we're interested in. So going the other way around where we actually start with a sample and ask these people, ask everyone in our sample to participate in a study um, is actually much more productive, I think, because then that, that also allows us to say something and to learn how these um, selection effects, for example, in, in organic data um, exist. And I call this uh, design big data. So, so this idea of collecting big data, but then in a controlled way, in a design way. So what you have here is you now have this extra that you can then study measurement error in a better way. So the example here from, from if I link it to the example that we did, in this travel app study, what we had was we had data about trips that people made using the GPS data. Um, and we could infer from that what mode of transport people use. For example, how fast is the trip? How long is it? Is it starting and ending at a train station? Then it's probably a train trip. We also, however, had survey data, right? Respondents, they, they labeled these trips, some of these trips at least. So they told us whether the train was by trip or not. And so we can use these two sources to actually say something about the quality of measurement of both the survey data and the organic data. So this is very helpful. Another thing that we can do is we can study selection bias. And I think this is even the more, more important case because we know from the literature that a lot of the big data and organic data studies are using volunteer samples, and it's often unclear how representative these samples are. Design big data would allow us to study this in more depth, right? So there we have, for example, in this, in this travel study, we have this rich frame data from Statistics Netherlands that we can use to study selection bias. Who are the people that are willing to participate in these app studies and, and um, provide us with this organic data? In the picture study, we actually have survey questions, right? So we, apart from the picture data, we actually asked a lot of survey questions, but also in the list panel, we have a lot of survey data from previous studies that were conducted there. And we can use these data to also understand who are the people now that are willing to do this and uh, provide us with good data. And in the end, of course, you have now not, not four cells in the table anymore, but you have six cells. Right, so, so this is this idea of, of doing data fusion, having data from multiple sources, trying to study the errors in every source and then trying to combine the good information that you can get from every source and produce better statistics. So I think as a field, this is a very exciting way to, to move forward and learn more about how to do data with, how to collect data with smartphones but also in the end to improve the quality of survey data. Okay, finally, a bit more, where are we going now? So this is, we're still working on many different projects. So in September, we will um, do a, the time use survey of the Netherlands, which is also a diary based study. And we will also use a smartphone app for that to, to study how people spend their time. And then in next year, we have two projects lined up. One is a budget survey 
And the other one is a new version of the travel app survey. So we will improve the app and uh, then do it for real um, um, uh, from next year on. All right, if you want to know more, um, here is my email address. Feel free to always drop me an email. You can also find more information on my personal website. And we also have a project website. If you uh, would like to know more about the project, you could also go to the, to the website that you see listed here. We call this the WIN project. Uh, in Dutch, it's a very nice uh, abbreviation, but um, it also sounds nice in English, but it doesn't really mean anything in English. So uh, thank you all for listening. Um, I'll be taking some questions until uh, the hour is over. All right, so I will go to the chat again. All right, um, so first, question is here can the app work offline uh, so this was a, a question i think between the on the first study the smartphone travel study so yes the app works offline so the way the app works or at least how we set it up was that the app would send the data on on the travel and the, and the labeling and the surveys whenever the phone was connected to wi-fi um, so this was also because some respondents we we knew from cognitive testing that respondents were interested were sometimes concerned about uh, their data plans right and uh, using a lot of of internet um, data so so the app would send uh, with Wi-Fi uh, and that worked fine uh, except for some uh, some specific cases so we found that there are some respondents who never connect to wi-fi so this was kind of a surprise but but it does happen and so what then happened was that these respondents uh, that all the data that we collected stayed on the phone forever um, but also that uh, the way we found out about this was actually that respondents started calling us after a week or longer and then complaining about the fact that the app became quite slow um, and that was because the app was just saving more and more data. And, and because of that, the phone got quite full and quite slow. Um, so Hi, differences with... Sorry, oh. Peter. I was going to... Uh, <laughs> Hi, Debbie. Hi, sorry. You, I needed you to unmute me. Um, yeah, I tried, but it didn't work. I think it yeah, only worked when worry. you were the host. So I don't know if you want to carry on. Um, just picking out questions yourself or whether you yeah, want to... Yeah, unless you maybe have a question that I didn't answer yet and that you think I should answer because I... I, I uh... Well, there were quite a few questions on the, on the, on the Travel Diary app. Yeah. Um, so I wondered, there was a question here about dropout and when respondents have to agree to data sharing. Uh, there was a question about how this request is presented to the respondent. Is there something that could be done here to reassure respondents and increase participation? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. So, so, first, so first of all, respondents have to um, register the app, right? So that's in a way the, the first, it's like we consider that the normal survey opt-in, right? So if they opt-in, if they start a survey, they opt-in to do it. We, we consider that registering. Then they had to um, allow us uh, to do um, location tracking. And there were actually two questions there. So there was one question asked by the operating system and then one by the app. So there was again, sort of two opt-ins there. What we did in communications as well is that there was a setting in the app where we allowed respondents not to track them, right? So they could turn this on and off themselves. And also there was a button that would put them in direct contact with the help desk. And uh, the way we explained this to respondents was if there were any concerns or if the app didn't function or they wanted to stop sharing their data, they could, they could contact us like that um, with this button. And actually there were quite a lot of respondents that called our help desk for all kinds of different reasons. So the help desk functionality worked quite well it wasn't an automated procedure, right? So there wasn't a button that said, please unsubscribe and delete all my data or something like that. Respondent really had to call. Maybe that's something that we can improve on. Okay. There's another question about the cost, the time and the money of developing this kind of app. Yeah. Um, could you say a bit about that? Yeah, so so I would, we were in a fortunate situation that, um, 
we did this all internally. So there were IT people from Statistics Netherlands. They have a big IT department. And there were a couple of people there who, who basically got time to do this, to do the development work on the app. And so these were already paid. These were permanent staff. So we, we didn't have to specify the budget for them. And we were lucky there, I think, because if we would have had to do that, I think the app would have been really quite costly. Um, I, for the travel app, I think it, it took about two years full time for developers to, to really develop this from the very first version to the version that went into the field. This was also because it was the first time that we did this, right? So I think we can, I know we are more efficient now, but it really took a long time. And it also took a long time in actually processing all this data. So setting up the back end, making sure that that is stable, um, and then processing all the, all the GPS data. So we had, we had location data uh, for summers when they were traveling every second and otherwise every minute for a week at least. So this was really a lot of data that we had to handle and summarize and, and, and deal with. So uh, I, I don't have a clear answer to what was the cost, but if you would, in, in terms of hours, there are several years of work going into this. So I'm going to take one or two of the more general questions to finish with. So there's a question here about what do you think the future holds for smartphone data collection? Mm -hmm. Would it replace official surveys? So I think that what's being asked here is whether we'll move away from asking surveys to collecting data that's generated through um, people's smartphones. It's a million dollar question, right? I, I, I would, I'm tempted to say, uh, to say yes, but, but only for specific kinds of studies. So for example, I think diary studies, so studies that we now do with diaries, I think we all know that these diaries are burdensome, that the quality of the data that we collect there are, is not great. And smartphone apps, I think, really can do better there. So, so this, this is a particular area where I think that this will happen. Another area maybe, but this is not so much for official statistics, but it's something that you see happening is if you want to do in the moment measurements. So especially in psychology, this is a subfield that's developing quite quickly. Um, there are also some sort of um, problems though that, that start to become larger and larger. So first of all, you have to rely on Apple and Google and their operating systems and also what they allow you to do. So with every new version of the operating system that they release, there are different possibilities of doing things with apps. So that means, first of all, that you have to update your app um, continuously to keep up to date with the overall changes. But Google and, and Apple, and Apple in particular, has become more restrictive uh, over time in what they allow apps to do and not. And I don't know where this is going, but if this continues, uh, we may end up in a situation where it's so difficult to collect some of these data with apps um, that, that it becomes impossible. Uh, we're not there yet, but, but there's definitely, um, um, the developers seem to be going in, in that direction. Um, and also, as an app developer, so if you're developing an app, I think you're, you're up against uh, Google and, and Facebook and other um, big tech companies who know how to develop apps. They know the back doors of the operating systems and, and, and there's, a, there's a sort of, there's a race going on there. Also respondents expect an app that looks good, right? So you also have respondents expectations. I think going forward, respondents will more and more in terms of visual design of the user experience and, and I don't know whether as academic or government researchers we can uh, keep up with that let alone know what's the effect of this whole COVID, COVID situation so every country is now releasing these apps for tracking and tracing and whatever and it could be um, a moment where where the general population um, yeah, I don't know, it could, could be a moment where people accept apps more, but it could also be a moment where people start caring about their privacy more and more. And uh, 
um, not wanting to download apps anymore. I, I don't know. Great. Well, thank you so much, Peter. That was a fascinating talk. There were lots and lots of questions on the chat um, tonight. Um, just to let everybody know that a copy, a recording of this tonight's seminar will be available shortly on the City website and you'll get an email letting you know where you can find that to remind you of the, um, the URL for that. I'm sure you'd all like to um, join with me in thanking um, Peter very much for a fascinating talk and we look forward to hearing more about your research. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks all of you for um, attending and uh, I don't know if the chat stays open but I will uh, I will stay here for a little bit at least and, and try to answer some of the questions that you asked. So the, his question was first of all about battery problems. Um, and and what, we, what we did actually, one of the things that you can do with apps, you can monitor people's battery level. And that's what we did. Uh, <laughs> so we knew at any, at any point in time how much battery life our respondents had. And what we found is that uh, we had perhaps only five respondents who ever ran out of battery so respondents we we did ask our respondents right to charge the battery at the end of the day but respondents were really good at that and and our also the app was designed in such a way because we we relied mostly on on wi-fi for location tracking and that that doesn't consume a lot of battery so our app was quite quite good in that sense um with gps did we have problems with gps Yes, we did. Uh, so GPS and Wi-Fi are really quite good, and but they're not extremely precise. So that is one problem. Uh, you have to do quite a lot of filtering of the data to to make the data um, uh, to yeah to make them ready for analysis. And a second problem is that um, these sensors, GPS sensors, and especially GPS sensors, they suffer from from two problems. The first one is cold starts. So when you're picking up your phone and you're moving about, it takes a while to actually make a connection to the GPS satellite. You may know this from your car. It's the same problem. Uh, so you, we often miss the start and the end of the trip, and that's a bit of a problem. Um, uh, a second problem is in very urban, highly urbanized areas with a lot of skyscrapers and stuff like that. Again, the, 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 or on the grounds, the, the connection to the satellite is often lost as well. And so you then don't get precise um, GPS data. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, so there was a question from Danielle asking, have you looked at how much data people are willing to give via apps? Um, in the picture study, are people willing to take more than one picture or in the travel study, are people willing to add more than one label to a journey? Yes, so, uh, so this, in our studies, uh, this wasn't like a goal of our study, but we found in the app to, uh, that, that people really labeled a lot. So especially with the stops, um, about 70% of our respondents labeled all or almost all their stops. Uh, so they were really good with that. With the trips, it was not so much, but I think there was in a way also like a design fault in our, in our app. But yes, people were quite willing. And also with the, with the picture study, people there were also quite willing with the caveat there that these are respondents from the list panel. And these are respondents that, that are used to being asked all kinds of things and they, they're, they're really trained and very motivated. So. There's another question related to the pictures about whether um, respondents got any feedback whilst they were taking these pictures or as they were uploading them about, for example, whether the brand or the type could be recognized. That might yeah. No, no. So that's the same as the question earlier about the machine learning. Ideally, you would, you would want to get some, some feedback, like directly give feedback to respondents directly. However, the way that the survey was programmed, it was programmed in Blaze. Um, mm -hmm. doesn't, Blaze doesn't allow for these kind of models to be sort of embedded in, this, in the survey. Um, what we did notice as well with the pictures, so one reason why some pictures were not usable was that they were um, hazy, right? So respondents didn't focus correctly. Um, and so we could, we could see that it was a heating system, but, but not more than that. Um, there were also some problems with uh, lighting. So sometimes these heating devices are in an attic or uh, 
in a in a dark room of your house <laughs> and some people just didn't turn on the lights before taking a picture for example um, so so then we just got a flash one giant flash and that's all we got as a picture <laughs> so yeah um and another final question i think on the pictures was around data protection issues and yeah. how they apply to pictures taken by respondents yeah um you mentioned that you excluded a whole bunch of um, yeah we did so so there was uh, when the data cam came in there was one person who got access to the raw pictures and what he did was just delete any from the server uh, any pictures where there was personal identifying information. So this could have been a, a pic, like a framed picture on the wall, or it could have been a, a label with an address of, um, of a respondent, for example. And we just deleted them from the server directly. Ideally, again, of course, you would, you would have something built in to prevent this, but we weren't able to do that. And so, we said there's one person who's going to do that, and and I, as a researcher, for example, I have never seen those pictures. So I, there was just one person who saw these pictures and then just deleted them so that no one else could see them. Uh, so somebody's asking about whether the specific problems you're describing with um, the GPS, for example, problems, if they're published anywhere. Oh yes, so there's there's a big body of literature on on GPS measurements. So uh, because they're used in uh, car navigation, for example, and, and there they suffer from the exact same problems. Uh, so yeah, so these are mostly jour uh, engineering journals. So uh, or or physics journals even because that's where these sensors were actually first uh, first used. Uh, yes. Then another question is of course what to do with them, right? So you also have, because of these problems, you, for example, have missing data. So you have to do something with this missing data. And, and normally in, in car navigation or so, they don't care so much about the missing data, right? They don't know where you are in the car for 20 seconds. That's fine. They just project you driving straight. And once they pick you up again, they give you the right instructions. And that's fine. But in our case, we want to get official statistics, right? We want to know how many trips do people take? What's the distance of all these different trips? So then it, the missing data do matter. Um, and there's one PhD student um, in Utrecht University who's now working on, on dealing with this missing data. And there's much less literature on, on that topic. So whoever is interested in that can send me an email and then um, I can give you some, some references to the literature that I know about. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, so there's a, I'm only gonna do, I think we should just do two more. Yeah, and, that's um, fine. Wrap up, because we, I think we're, we're getting through quite a lot. So there's a question here about, uh, this is again related to the, the Travel Diary app. Um, you mentioned there were some users, user interaction with the app, e.g. entering a location stop. Do you have any data on how much data you, users entered versus how much you inferred and do you have any experience of trying to collect any other data such as journey purpose um yeah this is a good question so so for the stops again we had about 75 percent of all the stops that we identified with gps were actually labeled by respondents mm -hmm. for the trips it was about 40 percent so uh, much less so um, when it comes to purpose, this is this is a this is a good question. So we have respondents gave a label to a stop, right? So this could be home, could be work, could be school or something like that. So in a way that already identifies what the purpose is. But of course, sometimes you don't you don't know what the purpose is. So sometimes respondents give a label that says uh, shop, but does this mean they go there to work or does it mean they go there for shopping? Uh, and what kind of shopping do they do? We didn't ask for that um, because we wanted to keep the app light and not have too many questions. Um, but we can maybe infer this, right? Based on the actual location. So we, we, we can link these data to point of interest. So we, we know where, where the people were in the shop, right? And we, we can then maybe infer if you go to a shop for let's say only half an hour, 
you probably don't go there to work but to actually do shopping. And if you go there for eight hours in a row on the same location, you probably go to the same shop for work. So we, I think we can infer the purpose, at least in, in some way, <laughs> uh, but we didn't, we didn't go there yet. It's a good, it's a good point. We should, we should do that. Okay, so there was a question about whether the app works offline. Yeah, it, it does. So, um, uh, I don't know, did I talk about this? I don't know, I don't remember. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll say this again. Yeah, it, it did work offline. So it would send uh, data, it, it, it worked fine offline, everything worked. Uh, the data was, this, the, the app was designed actually to work as an offline app and it would then periodically send the data to a central database. And this was done whenever people were connected to um, Wi-Fi. And also when the battery, as long as the battery level was not below a certain percentage. Um, and otherwise it would skip this step and wait until uh, sort of better times are there. And um, what, yeah, we, we found that most people connect to Wi-Fi at least once a day and they charge their battery also every day, so. Okay, I think, I think we should call it, call it a day. Thank you again, Peter. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Yes. Really, en yep. really engaging presentation, generating lots of interest, Peter. Yeah, Thank thanks you so much. Thanks, everyone, again for attending. If, if, if there are more questions now, I can imagine there are. Um, do, feel free to, to uh, send me an email, and I'll probably tomorrow or so I will go through them and uh, send you answers. And, and thanks also, uh, Debbie, for uh, hosting this and. Um, answering the questions. I, there was, a, there was a, a bit of an issue with me trying to hand back the mic to you. That's uh, all right, don't worry. <laughs> it it kind of worked, I don't know. Yeah. I, had, I think there's, a, there's an issue with the hosting thing. We're all trying to figure out how Zoom works, right? It, yeah, <laughs> and it's late in the day for a lot yeah, of us. So. It, a, <laughs> it, was, it worked fine, I think. So, um, so thanks everyone. Thanks a lot. Take care, Peter. Take care as well, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.